Often, those who profit from religion say more when they preach than they think that they do. Of course, they rely on their flock not to read between the lines, but it takes only a moment of consideration for an inquiring mind to strip away the rhetoric and lay bare the real message. Ham's recent facile post is ostensibly a response to a paper by Hoffman et al., published in the September 2014 issue of Science, and titled Morality in Everyday Life. Now, Ham has either not read the paper, or, as likely, simply ignores the important points made therein because of his desire to make his own fatuous point. The paper itself is interesting, if not earth-shattering. The study attempted to drill down to people's everyday morality. Past studies of moral dilemmas, including those supported by fMRI studies, have involved contrived scenarios, thought experiments like the trolley dilemma, where you are in charge of a railway and have to choose to send a train down one of two tracks. In doing so, you become responsible for some level of fatality as a result. Sophie's choice experiments are not something we come across every day, and this study wanted to bring the study of morality down to the everyday level. From the paper, we recruited a large demographically and geographically diverse sample, 1,252 adults aged 18 to 68 years, from the United States and Canada. Each participant was randomly signalled five times daily on his or her smartphone for three days between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. At each assessment, participants indicated whether they committed, were the target of, witnessed, or learned about a moral or immoral act within the past hour. They could also respond none of the above. For each moral or immoral event, participants described via text entry what the event was about. They also provided contextual information on the moral event, e.g. location, and completed state measures of nine distinct moral emotions, such as guilt and disgust, on a scale from zero, not at all, to five, very much, momentary happiness, how happy do you feel at the moment, from minus three, very unhappy, to plus three, very happy, and sense of purpose, do you feel that your life has a clear sense of purpose at the moment, from zero, not at all, to four, very much. Religiosity and political ideology were assessed during an intake survey upon study registration. Now, the key findings which I took from the study were that we are all subject to moral contagion. If we are the recipient of a moral act, then we are more likely to commit a moral act shortly thereafter. Moral licensing. If we commit a moral act, then we are more likely to commit an immoral act later, and less likely to commit a second moral act. Selective reporting. We are more likely to hear of immoral acts from other sources and are more likely to report our own moral acts. None of this is earth-shattering stuff, but it might give us pause for thought. The study also reveals an unsurprising divergence in moral reporting between conservatives and liberals, and it was found that religious views did not have any effect on how often a person commits moral acts. Again from the report, religious people reported fewer immoral experiences overall, but this difference was mostly attributable to religious people reporting having learned about immoral acts less often, a possible result of selective exposure rather than having committed immoral deeds less often than non-religious people. However, religious people experienced more intense self-conscious emotions such as guilt, embarrassment and disgust in response to the immoral deeds they had committed and more pride and gratefulness in response to moral deeds. As I said, nothing earth-shattering, but it is useful, I think, to ponder these things as we consider our own thoughts and deeds. Now, you will have got none of this from Ham's post. All Ham wanted to do is damn us all. It's important to understand that even though atheists and agnostics can be moral, they have no ultimate authoritative basis for their morality. When an atheist or agnostic calls something right or wrong, or good or evil, they are borrowing from a biblical worldview in order to make that statement. Think about it. If we are simply the byproduct of evolution and no better than animals, then why should anyone behave morally? Well, that's an easy one, Ken. Evolution requires that our genes survive long enough to get passed on. 
If you are a solitary crocodile or a shark, then you do not have to concern yourself so much with social niceties. But if you are a creature dependent on a level of social cohesion to either protect you from predators or enable you to prey on other well-defended creatures, then you need to follow the basic rules which allow you to operate as a unit rather than as an individual. And when you evolve socially as humans have done, then you must, to survive, evolve complex moral codes and constantly revisit the existing moral paradigms. Many civilizations have flourished generation upon generation because they got enough right to ensure their long-term success. All of them ultimately failed because the morality under which they were run either was unfit to keep the society together or was not robust enough to withstand outside influence or attack. Human social history has been one of the strongest exploiting the weakest. It is only recently that the struggle for day-to-day -day survival has been removed from many of our lives, and this has allowed us to reflect on the plight of those who still suffer this struggle. Christianity has a proud history of telling those at the bottom of the human social ladder that their struggle is their own fault because of something some mythical ancestor did in a magical world a few thousand years ago. Hard science has shown us that we have trees alive today which predate the mythical age upon which Christianity is based, and our hard-earned leisure time has allowed our social sciences to bring into focus our attitudes towards all the other creatures with which we share this planet. The morality of the Bible was constructed by men to rule others and was suited for them and for the time in which they lived. That much of it is common sense simply comes down to the evolutionary prerogative. That Ken Ham is proud to state, the only reason that anyone can be moral is because God's law is stamped on their hearts, only serves to illuminate the lack of basic scientific understanding held by the writers of the Bible. Our morality develops in our brains and not our hearts. If you want to take the lead from a book which tells you that you think with your heart, that the earth is younger than trees which you can visit today, and which has been used to defend morally reprehensible acts since the day it was written, fill your boots. If you want to listen to a man whose livelihood and that of his extended family depends on you swallowing what he says and paying his family's mortgage, fill your boots. But if you want to think for yourself, with your brain and not your heart, then I urge you to read the article and then read the Bible, and finally ask yourself, where does your morality come from? Thank you as always for watching.